Maslow is sort of the hero of my book because he's the one that was struggling in the deepest way with some of the questions of how, how to move psychology in a better direction, how to deal with problems of good and evil, how to deal with problems of health and sickness. He was kind of childlike in his optimism. He was very enthusiastic. He was grandiose. He had these ideas that he could change. By changing psychology, he could change the world. At times in his journal, he's really crass. At times, he's criticizing everybody, even his closest friends. He feels like people betray him if they're not working towards his vision. So he's complicated in that way, and that's kind of what I'm drawn to. I'm drawn to the fact that he's both of these things. He's the kind of person that we want to be able to understand when we want to be able to understand human psychology. He's whole in that way. He contains the good parts and the bad parts and the optimistic and the really pessimistic, cynical parts. He fell in love with behaviorism in the 30s, and he thought of it as just this, the most exciting thing ever. He was really passionate about it. He changed his whole life to study it. He went to the University of Wisconsin, and he studied monkeys in Harry Harlow's lab. Frankly, doctor, if it comes to a choice between wire and cloth, it's reasonable to expect that any child will go to the cloth. It's a matter of creature comfort, like a baby with its blanket. But is this really love? He had the idea, when he was most in love with behaviorism, that behaviorism could solve all the problems of the world, that it was going to be this methodical way of solving all human problems. Well, what do you mean by saying that a baby loves its mother? Certainly one thing we mean is that it gets a great feeling of security in the presence of the mother. Now, Mr. Collingwood, wouldn't you say that if you frightened a baby, that it went running to its mother, was comforted, and then all the fear disappeared and was replaced by a complete sense of security that that baby loved its mother. Slowly, and then quickly, fell out of love with behaviorism. He started seeing contradictions in life. And then when his first child was born, he looked at her and he thought she was so small and mysterious and so much a person already that all of the behaviorist theories didn't apply anymore. There was something transcendent about it, something that was evading all of behaviorist study. When he founded Humanistic Psychology, his critique was that we were too concerned with reducing people to a couple of variables, that we wanted to get rid of too much that was important to people, and that what we needed to do was make the study of individuals bigger. We needed to, it to include more. We could bring back wonder and awe and transcendence and religion and all of these things into the study of people. His enthusiasm was contagious. I mean, he was able to assemble all of these people essentially to start a movement. And he wasn't afraid of taking risks. So he wasn't afraid of publishing scientific studies that weren't very scientific yet. They were kind of preliminary. And he could make big claims about people and about human nature that hadn't yet been supported with adequate research because the conversation needed to start. There was a huge, big, gaping hole in psychology. All the things that were important and precious, you know, where was goodness and where was nobility? Where was uh, loyalty and uh, where was courage? Well, the behaviorists had nothing to do with it, you know, it was just nothing. Because, I mean, you don't find these things in white rats. That's what we lived on then. He had this theory of peak experiences, which were these times in our lives when we're kind of 
lifted outside of ourselves and our environment. So there's a time when there's an absolute perfection to what we're experiencing. And that these kind of heights of human existence that we're capable of couldn't be understood by quantitative psychological study. Humanistic psychology became this other thing very quickly. It became what we call the human potential movement. So it was encounter groups of the 60s where people were going on marathon retreats and kind of digging up all of their darkest, most toxic thoughts. When I have my power, I am frightening. See, I frighten you with my power. I frighten you with my power. Couples were doing this, and there were black-white encounter groups in which there was racial confrontation. Oh, you're so sure looking at me, huh? You got the goddamn police in the neighborhood. Really? They're not my police. You got a governor. You got a mayor. Oh, really? You got the president. And later in the decade, there were women's encounter groups where women were really getting in touch with their anger at men and sometimes with their spouses. So that was one manifestation of it. Humanistic psychology became caught up in the counterculture of the 60s. It was kind of wrapped up in the sexual revolution that happened a little bit later, and it was also reflected in the psychedelics movements in the 1960s. So it was kind of a justification, this idea that we could reach, we could have these peak experiences without really having to work for them, that you could take LSD and then you would suddenly be, you could transcend your own existence for a while. So it was mimicking peak experiences. So in general, it's kind of speaking to the culture in this larger way. And sometimes people don't know where the ideas are coming from. They're just kind of filtering out into the culture. He was in, very involved with this one growth center on, on the West Coast called Esalen, and he had a love-hate relationship with it. He thought they were doing some really good things. He was very close to the person who, was, who had founded it, but he also felt like the people got incredibly self-absorbed. He called them non-caring shits at one point. It was this idea that they were just so interested in themselves and the project of themselves that they didn't care about other people. And there were people who came to Esalen and squatted on the grounds and took the resources and did a bunch of drugs and had a bunch of sex and didn't really care about the repercussions of that for the Institute or for the other people that surrounded them. Well, Maslow thought we should be striving for self-actualization. So that could differ for everybody, but it was this kind of process-oriented thing where we're always trying to improve. We're trying to become less guarded, less defensive, more appreciative of beauty, more in the moment, more aware, more perceptive, feeling more, experiencing more. In 1967, he, he had a near-fatal heart attack and it really caused him, it humbled him, it caused him to reassess some of his own goals. So he stopped giving lectures, he stopped being so outward focused, and he became more focused on, he did more writing, but he also became more focused on his family, which he thought was primary, and particularly on his granddaughter, Jeannie, who was born in 1968. And he saw her as a model of self-actualization. So it gave him the idea that we were born with this near perfection, she was innocent and joyful and spontaneous and in the moment and all these things that we had to spend our whole lives getting back to. But this bond that he had with her allowed him to get back to it. So it caused him to kind of see more clearly what mattered and, 
I mean, he talked about these last years of his life where everything was stabbing him with its beauty. It was like everything was so powerful and amazing. It, I mean, it was almost unbearable. He was so present and so taking in so much all the time in these final years. And in some ways, this tiny granddaughter of his was a vehicle.